It's going to be about um, how to bring in, uh, let's see if this is going to work here for me. Oh, hold on. How to bring in predators. So, uh, which is a harder, one of the harder forms of uh, wildlife photography, like uh, a lot of the other animals, like, uh, you know, deer and that sort of stuff, they're, they're a little bit easier. And, but a lot of people tend to have a hard time with, with predators because they are extremely shy and, and that sort of thing. So, but uh, they're really driven by uh, food and so there's a lot of ways to, to lure them out. Um, so I'm going to talk about that. Uh, a lot of the stuff in, in our area, like this is a lot of the predators that we're going to find in our area. Um, Fisher and lynx are a little bit harder to uh, find, but fox and coyotes are are actually easier to lure out than than one might think. So, um, I've been doing general nature photography for the past 11 years, and for the past two years, um, or I should say, for the past five years, I've been focusing more on wildlife and less so much on general nature photography and the past two years I've been focusing more on predator photography I guess you could call it. Um, so get started here. Uh, so one of the number one ways to bring them in is using predator calls. Uh, so this is a this is a technique that I mean a lot of people use for hunting and that sort of thing, but uh, this is something we could use for photography as well. And so what it basically mimics is um, an injured rabbit call. Um, there's other calls that work, though in in my experience so far in the Sudbury area, we we actually have a lot of snowshoe hare in these areas, so. Um, the snowshoe hair call seems to work the best. Uh, when you're using uh, other animal calls like a, an injured fawn and a mouse squeak, you really have to be in an area where that would actually apply. Like in the springtime, an injured fawn would make more sense and it's something that a coyote or a wolf would actually hear every now and then. Uh, not so much uh, in other times of the month, but during you know, the time where fawns are actually coming out. Uh, and the, the mouse squeak is more for, uh, not so much coyotes and stuff like that, but more foxes and in and, and fields and stuff like that. So um, I have a injured um, hair call. I could show you real quickly here. So this is, um, this is similar to a duck call. Um, it's just a piece of plastic with a reed in it. Um, and so this one's got two on it. It's got the mouse squeak and it's got the injured uh, rabbit call. So if you were to actually set yourself up in an area where there, there is a lot of activity and you see a lot of tracks in the winter time and stuff like that, if you sit down and camouflage, We'll talk about camouflage. If you sit down in camouflage and call this for 20 minutes, uh, you have a pretty good chance that something's going to just poke its head out and investigate. So um, the mouse squeak, which is an over-exaggerated version of a mouse, it, mice aren't that loud, but it will attract something that's within Oh, not very far distance because it's not very loud, but if you did see something and you wanted to get their attention, that would definitely work. But what this is really is it's an injured rabbit call, so um, I won't do it too loud so I don't freak out the girls there behind the desk, but it's... So that, that's what an injured rabbit sounds like, and coyotes go absolutely nuts over that. Um, the other animals are a little bit smarter, like they, if you're not very good at calling yet, animals know it's fake. Coy coyotes, they don't seem to care. They just kind of come into most all of them. Um, 
but I, when I was first starting out, I, I called with that, and I went out ten times in a row, and I drew, drew in coyotes three times out of ten times. So out of ten times, uh, three is pretty good. If I did it a hundred times, I don't know if I would draw them out 30 times, but the odds so far seem pretty good. Um, it's just a matter of picking the right area. So I, I did it 10 times in a row one time just to see how many uh, coyotes I can draw out in different areas. Um, uh, the reason I targeted coyotes is because they are, um, they're the easiest ones to fool. And if, if some of you guys live in this area, um, Hanmer and Valley actually has a really high population of coyotes. Um, Coniston area has a high population of coyotes as well. Um, so the lynx have been around a lot too. There's been a lot of lynx lately. Lynx populations are way up. Um, so if you're north of Cape Rall or in Onaping area, um, lots of lynx. Um, so the call, the call works really well. It's going to work better if you pair it with a decoy. Uh, the problem with just using the call is you're calling the animal to you, and then what happens is they see you and uh, it's pretty much game over. So if you have a decoy, however, they're locked onto the decoy, and that gives you just a few more seconds to be able to take some pictures. Um, so a lot of times the decoy will hold their attention long enough that, that it lets you fire off some shots. Um, so if you're at least 50 yards from your decoy, um, it, it helps a lot. What is that? This is it's a video, so I'll, I'll play it. It's just a, a little furball on a motor um, that moves every now and then. And it's just supposed to mimic a small little animal. So uh, foxes and coyotes, they, they lock onto it and, and it, it keeps them off you. Uh, works really well. Then they're only about 60 bucks. Well, some of them are more than that, but you could get cheaper ones for about 60 bucks, uh, Bass Pro and stuff like that. And uh, they work really well. The animal collar itself um, is only $10 at Canadian Tire. So it's uh, it's one of the cheapest uh, photography accessories I've ever gotten. Um, so that's that's one method anyways of, of drawing them in. Uh, that's the number one method I prefer to use um, is calling them in um, because it they get excited and, and uh, a lot of times they actually come running in. Um, there's also uh, wireless callers that have uh, remote controls, and those have more options on them. Like this one, you're limited to just using an injured rabbit call. But there, there's some that have uh, everything from small dogs, which works actually. Uh, small dogs to rabbits to baby deer to everything pretty much coyotes and wolves like to eat for lunch. Um, so it's an interesting, uh, it's an interesting type of photography, anyways. Um, so a another way to bring them in, um, of course, is using roadkill and that sort of thing, um, which unfortunately we we see a lot. I'd rather photograph a raccoon that wasn't hit by a car, but if you take it instead of it being on the side of the road and actually put it in the bush, you, you can use it to your advantage. Um, and so baiting animals, whether you decide to bait animals or not, you, you have to be careful because one, in certain places baiting is illegal. You're not allowed to feed animals depending on your city you live in. There's bylaws. Uh, it's not illegal to feed animals in Sudbury. Uh, you're allowed to bait animals for trapping, hunting. Um, you could bait them for photography if you wish. Uh, but the, the best way to bait an animal, if you do decide to bait an animal for photography purposes, is really to just use natural um, food that they would be eating anyways, like roadkill or scraps. From hunters, a lot of us hunt, a lot of us hunt deer and, and moose and stuff like that. So you could save the scraps and use them for photography. 
Um, you don't want to obviously feed them anything from the grocery store because it's not natural. You don't want to feed them beef or anything either because you could spread diseases. Uh, but uh, things they would eat anyways, such as roadkill. Um, a lot of trappers, if you know a trapper, if you know a friend of a friend who knows a trapper because they're uh, living in Sudbury, there are a lot of people that do trap. Um, a lot of trappers have a lot of beavers because beaver meat, well, there's not really a market for beaver meat and it turns into either dog food or uh, they'll sell it to uh, bear hunters and stuff like that that are actually looking for um, bait. But if you know a trapper, you can get beavers from them and it happens to be a really good bait for predators. Um, So that's basically what you want to do is just keep it natural. You don't want to cook them a turkey dinner and, and put that out there or anything like that. Um, and I know not everybody likes picking up roadkill or anything, but it, if you're not sensitive to it, it does, uh, it does work. Um, So if you're doing all this, if, you're, if you are calling in predators, um, if you are using hunting scraps and bringing them in and, and stuff like that, obviously you have to stay hitting. Um, you need camouflage, you can't just stand out there. So uh, one of the least expensive forms of camouflage that I use is just a piece of burlap that's basically been painted. Uh, you could get it at Princess Auto, you could get it at Canadian Tire, it's very cheap. Um, but the burlap is somewhat see-through, so you have to be careful of that. Um, but if you are using a, a piece of burlap, uh, I see a lot of people use it and, and they, they tug it really tight and they stand beside it and it's a perfect wall of um, material. You don't want it to be a perfect shape like that because that stands out. You want to kind of break it up. So something like you see there, you just kind of stick sticks in it and, and break up the shape. And uh, burlap works really well. It's super lightweight and you could tie it to your backpack or whatever you're doing. Um, and you could photograph off the top end of it. Just your head and your camera sticking up and it, it works really, really well. Um, so if you, if you're uh, scouting out an area, uh, you could throw that up and just hang out for an hour, if you could spare an hour and see if anything uh, happens to enter that field or whatever. If you're in an area where there's lots of deer or uh, any sort of wildlife really, um, that works really well. Uh, so that was the, the least expensive form of camouflage I found. The tents are a little bit more money depending where you're going, but they're extremely great for photography because they do have the hole for hunters' rifles and stuff like that, so uh, for telephoto lenses they're great. And they usually have windows on the sides as well, so you could, you could really scope out an area for quite a while. Uh, and unlike the burlap like this, you could put a chair inside of it and, and you could really sit there for, well, all day if you want to, really and you're covered all around as opposed to the the burlap which is usually eight feet long it's hard to wrap it all around and and, and have enough space to uh be comfortable so i have a, it's like a double lawn chair but the material comes from the back and it drapes right flips over, over. It has the the bars in it oh, okay and it comes right down in front of you and has the side opening it's the front opening and from where you sit in the double chairs to the opening, there's not that much room. Okay, well that that's perfect. That's good for one person. And well, you uh, can sit two in there because oh, there's yeah. two chairs in it. Okay, so that that's so another very similar thing is that um, yeah, yeah, they work really well. Okay. You can get the Canadian Tire, uh, you, you could go Bass Pro or Cabela's, that sort of thing, but Canadian Tire's got them. Uh, they're kind of out of season right now. You might not find them right now, but it's you. Yeah. It folds down into like a little round thing. You just unzip it and pop it. 
Yeah, and they're, they're really nothing to bring with you. Um, and you could even just leave it in your car if you wanted to. Those round ones there, they just, you turn them and they pop up? It looks just like that. Where'd you get yours? Have you ever tried them? Yeah. And close them? Yeah. You just twist the risk of the door, I mean. Go ahead. That's a small one for my camera. <laughs> Actually, for those uh, dog house, those camo blinds, yeah. <clears throat> the cheapest place to get them is TSC when they come on sale. That's true. But yeah. TSC yeah. says they're $189 and they'll sell them for $70, $74. But you can get them at, uh, like you said, Bass Pro Libera, yeah. 112 regular. We do have a I TSC now. The one up there this hunting season was $70 for the armor strip. Uh, light, light streak one or something. I always forget about TSC, but it, yeah, it's a it's a good spot if I you're in the south end. All sold out. Okay. TSC was all sold out when I oh, went. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, they're um, you know they're lightweight, they're easy to pop up, and they're um, they're comfortable. And another thing is they uh, they keep the bugs off you in the summertime, and so uh, that's a big benefit too. You could stay out longer, be more comfortable. Um, they're also great, they're great for any sort of wildlife of course, but they're also great for bird photography too, which is the original source of me uh, getting one of these. Uh, so, yeah. Sorry, excuse me, one point with those, they've got three windows and a door. Yeah. And uh, don't keep the two side windows open or anything unless you're way back because I've tried it for oh, turkey yeah. hunting and yeah. just spooked them there. They'll, okay. they'll notice you. So I usually keep two windows open and sit in the corner and stuff, whichever yeah. I figure anything's going to come out from. Yeah, you really like, and this, when I took this picture, I was, not much was going to happen over here, but this is actually just that $10 piece of burlap that I draped over it, um, blocking off the two side windows, but... Um, yeah, you want to be careful that they don't actually see it through the, through the actual opening as well. Sir, depending what you're photographing, like if you take turkeys, for example, uh, they have uh, really good eyesight and they'll spot you. So. And blue herons too. <laughs> blue herons. And no, too April. <laughs> Hard to find in this area, blue herons. What about scent? Scent, you, you, you want to be downwind of course, um, and an easy way to do it, or just take some grass, throw it up. Um, another thing that a lot of people will do, just in case the wind changes, if you're in camouflage like this, like this is a ghillie suit. Um, so I'm photographing coyotes in this instance, but a lot of times uh, the wind will actually change and blow your cover, so what you can do is, on the bottom of your lens hood, you just take a piece of electrical tape and you tape a piece of string hanging off the bottom of your lens hood. And you just look at that string and you make sure the wind's blown in the right direction still. And you'll be blocking the wind if you're, if you're not in the right spot. Um, you really want that string moving so you know which direction the wind's coming from. But a lot of times the wind will change direction on you. And a lot of times when you're doing this style of photography, it just takes a, a great deal of patience. You're sitting out there for quite a few hours, so um, things could definitely change. So just a string is basically just a, a flag to, to show you which way the wind's going. Uh, the problem, though, that makes photography hard, unlike hunting. Hunting, you could, you could set up, you could be downwind, and uh, something comes out, and, and you, you get what you're getting. Um, it doesn't really matter where you set up so much. With photography, you have to pay attention to your background. You have to pay attention to other things, because you, you're trying to make a pleasing photograph. Right, so you, you don't want the animal to come out and you photograph them in front of a, a big uh, sand pile or something that's not so pleasing. So you have to set yourself up so that you're putting the animal into a nicer place, a nicer place. And, and that makes photography a lot harder. Um, 
so we're using the same principles as, as hunting and everything. We're just trying to be more visually uh, creative with it, uh, which is something you got to keep in mind too. Um, the ghillie suits are amazing. Um, they're incredibly warm, actually. They also keep the bugs off you. You could get up and change positions like that. You don't have to set anything up. Um, they're, they're really, really great. They're more expensive. You could get them for summer. You could get them for winter. Uh, the summer ones are made really well. Um, if you just crouch down, you're immediately hidden. There are some really, really nice ghillie suits, uh, but it, it gives you full movement of your arms and everything like that. And if something's coming up to your left, you could easily do this and still be hidden. You don't have to worry about windows or nothing. So it, the, the ghillie suit is probably the, the best form of camouflage that I've ever used. Um, that's a little harder to find. Like you're not going to find that at Canadian Tire. You're go you're going to have to likely order this online. Is there um, a place in Barrie that sells all kinds of sporting stuff type thing? Yeah, there is. Uh, is that Cabela's? Maybe that is Cabela's. Uh, Bass Pro is in Toronto, and so that must be in Barrie. Yeah, that's true. So you could order online, and and you know that sort of thing. Thing is with ordering it online, a lot of places, it depends on the size. Yeah, you gotta pay. So if you're going in that area, but it, it's worth it for sure. Um, yeah, and the good. Eighty dollars. That's a good price. That's a really good price. See, I, I got a hundred to two fifty. I see most of them there are hundred plus. The good thing about the ghillie suit too is if if you get it caught on a branch and a chunk rips off, like it really doesn't matter. Uh, if if you rip a little hole in your pop up tent, you're like, well, I'm fuming mad when I do that. Yes. But um, the ghillie suits, you you, I feel like you could abuse them a little bit more. Um, but they're they're really really great. Um, so have you got camel duct tape on your lens? Um, that is basically, yeah, it's, it's, um, yeah, it's for rifles, but it's basically camo tape. Um, and with the bigger lenses, sometimes the, the big, the black lens sticks out a little bit. Um, and when you're moving the lens, it stands out a little bit. So the, the camo helps. Um, and this is pretty much the last slide. This is recommended camera modes for um, wildlife photography in general, not so much just predators. Um, but before I get into the camera modes, uh, though I'm sure a lot of you probably shoot a similar kind of style like this already, is there any questions about um, the calling or, or baiting or anything like that? Okay, so if you are set up, you got the camouflage, you have your collar, you've been mimicking the guys on YouTube with the call and you're getting good at it. Um, the winter time is the best time to do this because it's very obvious what's been where. And nobody has to be man tracker to figure out that's a rabbit. And, you know, that's definitely not a dog. So um, in the summertime, it's a lot harder. So. Uh, this presentation is kind of good timing because the winter time is the ideal spot f or time for this. Um, so what I do pretty much is once I'm all set up, I'm in an area that I like. I think there's a good chance. Um, I usually set up early in the morning when it's still dark and then I let the sun come up and then I start calling uh, early in the morning. Uh, so my camera modes, before I start shooting, I just double check that I'm on aperture priority. Um, a on your camera, or AV if it's a Canon, which is just aperture value, but it's the same thing. Um, and it's basically 3.5 to 5.6 because that's what my lens is. And so I keep my aperture as large as possible. Um, if you have a 2.8 telephoto lens, 
uh, then that would be ideal because early in the morning our light isn't necessarily going to be the best or if you decide you want to start calling earlier um, 2.8 is going to be an advantage to you because you could start photographing earlier uh, and a lot of times it only takes five minutes for an animal to actually come out uh, surprisingly enough and they catch you off guard um, so aperture priority is good um, you don't want to be shooting wildlife at f11 or anything because your shutter speed will be not adequate enough for that style of photography um, ISO 400 minimum the reason I say 400 minimum is because I mean 100 ISO is going to give you the the least grainy results um, that's so that that's what we all try to do but keep 400 at your minimum with this style of photography because a lot of times if you do spot something and he's standing still he doesn't know you're there whatever it is you're taking pictures uh, they could see you they could run away just like that and so if you're 400 ISO minimum you will most likely have a shutter speed that's good enough for movement and for an animal staying still. If you're 100 ISO and an animal takes off and you follow it and shoot as it's taking off and then you're disappointed to see that most of them are blurry. So if you have 400 as a minimum usually your, your, ISO, your, sorry, your shutter speed is going to be a little bit more adequate for, for this style of photography. Um, if you're doing landscape and stuff, then 100 ISO is great for that, but uh, you never know when action is going to start, and so that's going to help you a lot. Um, and because of a lot of the movement, then you have burst mode, which I, I keep on 24-7, whether I'm photographing wildlife or not, because you still have the option of taking one photo or taking a bunch. Um, so you don't have to stop what you're doing and change it to burst mode off of single and it's just always ready for you. Um, single point focus, uh, that's because you're trying to focus on an animal, which is a very specific thing. You're not focusing on the whole general scene. Um, and a lot of times also you're focusing through a bush or through a hole to photograph that animal. Uh, whether it's a, a coyote or a, a bird or a squirrel or whatever, you want that focus on their face, uh, specifically their eyes. So you, you want that uh, ability to aim and single point focus will give you that. Um, and then quality raw, if you have the means of editing at home and, and you could process raw files, then it's best to shoot raw. Um, because you could you could save a lot of photos that are mediocre um, with raw files. You could bring uh, your exposure back a little bit better. Uh, you could handle the actual file a little bit more with raw. And then for focal length, this is um, this kind of depends on really your setup. Uh, a 300 minimum uh, would be good for this style of photography. A 600 would be better, of course. Um, the camouflage helps a lot because a lot of times, I mean, and if some of you guys hunt, you know you could get within yards of, of animals if you're patient enough. Um, but yeah, that those are that's a guideline. You don't have to use these modes. A lot of people like to shoot manually. A lot of people like to shoot on shutter priority. Um, I just find aperture priority is quick. Um, does anybody have any questions about that? So that's pretty much the presentation um, on that. Have you ever felt unsafe? Have you ever called something in and then felt kind of... Uh, no, I've never felt unsafe. There, there is an adrenaline rush for sure. Um, I've actually taken blurry shots because I was shaking so much, but it's not unsafe. It's more just a general excitement. Um, I've actually screwed up photographing coyotes and stuff because they come out a little closer than you expected, and you just, oh my God, you know. But uh, no, I've never really felt unsafe. Are you with you or are you on your own? Uh, most of the time I'm alone, um, or I'll go with one other person. 
you can't really go with with more than one other person um, sometimes I bring someone and they'll videotape me for YouTube and stuff like that but um, the best thing to do is to be by yourself and the more time you spend out there the more comfortable you get um, and if you do hunt or if you have a partner that hunts and you have that experience with animals then you're a little bit more comfortable but um, yeah surprisingly enough I'm, I'm not s scared when uh, um, definitely not when a fox comes out or something like that but the one time we actually called in a wolf it was in and gone in a flash so it's like you're more disappointed than anything uh, the only animal that's hung out for more than three minutes that I've called in has been a coyote because they're extremely curious and they're extremely nosy so um, so that is that. Does anybody else have any questions? Yes? Just out of curiosity, you're shooting in single point. Like, I mean, I know it's like, you know, with birds and stuff, we'll go in continuous mode because you want to be able to get it. Why wouldn't you shoot in a continuous mode? Because I would assume that some of these animals that are coming up, they ain't there for long. I mean, they're in and out of the fly. He is shooting in continuous Well, you, you mean uh, continuous autofocus? Or... Uh, you, could, you could shoot in continuous autofocus. I'm using a single point. Um, but you can set your camera. I usually set my camera to, um, uh, which well on Canon it would be one shot, so it locks on. Um, for Nikon, I I guess it's just single, but it it does lock on. You could put it on active mode, so it's constantly following the the subject. Um, but in terms of actual points or spots, autofocus points, I like to put it on one. Um, but yeah, you can use a, a locking autofocus or you could use a, an adjusting autofocus. So there's two autofocus modes, the amount of points you use and then whether it locks or whether it tracks. Um, but either one would actually work. Um, on Canon, it's AI Servo. Yeah. Is it all Servo? AI Servo. AI Servo. Yeah, Servo, yeah. AI Servo, as soon as you profess the shutter, trigger, the shutter halfway, it'll Lock. keep on tracking. Yeah. Which would work. Uh, sometimes if, if you are moving a little bit, because we have these big telephoto lenses, there, there is going to be some movement. If it is on Servo and it's adjusting, it might adjust and then readjust and then adjust on a branch or something that might be in the way um, so that's why I like to use the locking so I just lock it on the animal and then photograph them um, so you do everything handheld then you don't use a tripod no I don't use a tripod I'll use a monopod um, what I found in the tents is if, if you're in the tents um, and you're sitting down in the tents the tripods they take up a lot of room and if something happens, you go to move your tripod and the tripod hits the tent and it's just, it, it's a lot, it's one extra thing to worry about. Um, I have used a monopod basically just sitting on my butt and the monopod's between my legs and it, it just helps your arms a little bit. But uh, the tripods, um, they, uh, they take up a lot of room so I, I don't typically use them and you shouldn't need it because you should have the shutter speed fast enough to to photograph the animal so uh, a monopod should work just fine or hand holding um, you definitely want a lens with stabilizer any other questions yeah um, I'll go to this slide real quick. That's one that I called out. He actually crossed the road and then I just brought him back with the injured, or not the injured, the mouse squeak. Um, some of this sort of stuff. This is all the same fox actually. Um, I'll see if I can make that bigger for you. That's not really big. Hold on. Like the moose picture you took over mm -hmm. Steve Tom. Oh. You have that, to see. that sort of thing there. This is this is an interesting kind of thing. Uh, this fox, this was actually he's got 
a blind in one eye. <clears throat> but uh, this is basically just uh, keeping their interest with the mouse squeak. Um, yeah, there's a couple moose. I, th I thought I had coyote pictures in here, but hold on. Um, yeah, I don't have much more. I'm not super organized with them. But, yeah, coyotes. I have more coyotes and fox shots than anything. Um, the few times I've seen a, a wolf, I haven't been able to get a shot of it. And I have yet to get a shot of a lynx. Mm. And that's my goal this winter. So, um, But so far from what I've experienced is uh, calling them in works really, really well. Um, Whereas baiting is more like a lengthy process because you got to go check it and you got to go rebate and everything else. But calling them in, you, you either get zero results or you get immediate results. And <clears throat> um, if you go out there and you call straight for 20 minutes and nothing happens, nothing's coming. Because the radius of the sound, it would only take an animal 20 minutes to get to where you are. So you could really go out early in the morning, call for 20 minutes, and uh, something will either happen or it won't, and you're home within an hour. So it's not a bad form of photography. You're not sitting out there, you know, for 12 hours like it seems like you are. Um, but even if you um, park your car kind of on the edge of a field and just call and call, it. Just see if it works. A lot of times a fox or something will poke its head out just to, just to check it out. So <clears throat> you don't have to go out there and sit in camouflage at the first time you try it. But you could try it just by, you know, close to home or in a vehicle, that sort of thing. But from what I've seen so far, and I've only been, I don't consider myself an expert in uh, calling in animals, but out of what I've done so far, I've had good results. So if you guys go out and, and decide to use predator calls, I think you guys will have pretty good results as well. If you're all camoed out and you're paying attention to the small details like the wind and stuff. And you also have an app on your phone that has wild calls, right? Yeah, there's an app. Like I have the app on my phone and <clears throat> there's a lot of calls. The problem with the phone is getting the volume out there um, and there are speakers you could buy for your phone that plug into the mic port and stuff and that helps project the sound out a little bit but I find with the phone you get kind of a um, like a magnetic -y kind of sound when it's too loud like it's it sounds like a speaker if that makes any sense it doesn't sound natural but the, the mouth call sounds a little bit more natural um, so you shot them all with the 300 uh, a 400, yeah, an 80 to 400, um, which isn't much more than a 300, so a 300 would work. And all my photos are cropped quite a bit. Um, I crop at least 50% of the photo uh, because it's hard to get as close as what I really want to get close. But No, it's a crop sensor camera on top of that, so that helps too, yeah. What do you think, guys? <coughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm.